Metro Manila, largest city in the Philippines. In many ways, it is typical of the developing world. In a city of over seven million people, almost one in four are squatters. The poor who flow into the cities of the third world and build flimsy structures on any vacant land they can find. The origins of the problem are here, in the countryside. Poverty, population pressures, shortage of land, few economic opportunities. These things drive the poor from the country into the city. The city is hope. Hope of jobs, education for their children, a better standard of living. In the Philippines, the hope is Manila, here is 80% of the country's industry. Hope, if not for them, at least for their children. And in Manila, things can be better. There are jobs, if you're lucky, and people get by. They're resourceful and independent. They want to survive. But often things are only marginally better, if not worse. In the city, there's often a different kind of deprivation. Unemployment, alienation, overcrowding, and inevitably, urban squalor. Talking about the Keep Manila Clean campaign. We need it here and everywhere. Take pride in your city. We all live here. Keep it clean. This is the Tonto in Manila. It's the biggest squatter area in Asia. Estimates of how many people live here vary between 200,000 and half a million. Conditions here are desperate. Compared to anywhere else in the city, there is far more crime, disease, deaths per thousand people, and children per family. There are fewer schools, less space, and almost no sewage, water, street lights, transport, or law enforcement. You can clean the face of your city by picking up the litter, even the smallest piece of litter. And yet, it's better than nothing. The people want to stay. It's close to work areas and to markets. There are opportunities. There's a strong sense of community and support. There is always hope for a better future. They don't want to move. For the government, the Tondo area has long been a problem. Originally, the land was reclaimed for harbor development, but was occupied by the squatters before development could take place. The government wanted at least some of the land back, but the squatters have no intention of moving. More than that, the area is an eyesore and an embarrassment, a constant reminder of the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots, and a breeding ground for political dissent. The government has tried several approaches, from forcible eviction, which didn't work, to forcible resettlement outside Manila, which also didn't work. Most of those resettled returned to Manila, the men anyway. Somehow someone had overlooked the fact that there was no work out there. Sapang Palai, one of the resettlement areas, is a sad place. 
populated mainly by deserted women and children. Another later approach was this showcase multifamily housing near the Tondo area. It answers middle income housing needs, but does not answer the real needs of the squatter community. Continued resistance by the people forced the government to try other approaches. It was decided to begin reclamation on land adjacent to the Tondo, the Degat de Gatan, with a view to relocating 140,000 squatters from the Tondo. With this in mind, in 1975, the International Architectural Foundation, with the cooperation of the Philippines government, held a competition to produce a prototypical design for housing and community development in the third world. A brief that should involve both communal cooperation from the people and sensitive, minimal governmental intervention. There were 476 submissions from 68 countries. It was won by Ian Athfield, architect of Wellington, a man who'd never left New Zealand until the day he left to pick up the prize money. This film concerns the life and work of this man and his contact with the third world. How would you like a film to be made about you? Christ, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I'm worthy of a film being made of me, you know. <laughs> Just put it another way. What would you like in a film about you? I really don't know. I suppose, you know, just the things that I, I enjoy doing, I suppose, being with people, uh, some sort of physical contact, uh, drinking, laughing. I suppose it's just, just when you're with people, I suppose, that's when, when you feel that it would be quite nice to capture those moments again, you know. Routine, a uh, yeah. alarm at uh, six o'clock. Uh, Chaos. And then uh, uh, usually a reasonably chaotic breakfast because there's always someone or something, someone doing something. A day begins in the slightly chaotic life of a slightly chaotic man. Athfield, one of New Zealand's most lively and innovative architects, has been in practice for 14 years. Even so, he still seems rather out of place as a member of this country's professional establishment. I had a grapefruit. Sorry, you can take this one. All right. No, I had what that. All right. Uh, you can have this one. All right. No. All right. You can have I'll this one back again. And it's a walk down the hill. That's the best part, possibly, of the day. It's just between leaving the house and the partial chaos and getting to the office. So there's a tendency to dawdle. I pass the sheep. Jack's only there as a lawnmower, as a silent lawnmower. That's, that's basically all he's there for. I'm not very endeared with him. He ate the uh, Scotch ladies' cabbages uh, the year before last. He's just eaten my cabbages last week because I left the gate open. Been to work and, and, and trying to be an architect, I suppose. Day. Hey. <laughs> Shut what have you done to your hair? <laughs> <laughs> Had to come with the ginger mint last night. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Athfield's office, just down the hill from his house, is one of a succession of boxy houses set in a galley. But this house, in spite of a welter of legal difficulties, is undergoing something of a transformation. In Athfield's office, things are a little different. For one thing, work and profit are shared on a cooperative basis. For another, everyone in the office actually gets out and builds where necessary.
The process of change is almost complete for now. And the office has become inexplicably something like a Victorian pub. The reconstruction of the office is not the first renovation they've undertaken. Well, we got involved in old buildings for two reasons. One, I didn't want to take on half-baked clients doing half-baked buildings and thought we'd make some money out of them. And the other reason is I like old buildings. So we decided that uh, we'd buy them and work on them. So we've worked on uh, three which we've personally had some sort of interest in ourselves and we've worked on two or three others for other clients. The first one was Plymouth Emporium in the centre of Wellington, which we changed from a private hotel into shops. The second one was the Grand Hotel in Palmerston North, which was um, derelict at the time we, we bought it, and we changed that into uh, a bank, private hotel, licensed restaurant. Uh, and the third one was a building at 12 Bullcott Street, which we have just finished restoring last year. Uh, I think the most important thing about them uh, is that uh, uh, it is possible to save buildings, uh, provided you can change the use and make them economically viable by uh, increasing the rental structure of the buildings. There are these reference points where people lived in, people loved in, they just have a feeling, you know, which is beyond your lifetime, which is very, very important. That's something which a city can hinge itself on. That's something which uh, new buildings can relate to. Most of Earthfield's renovation work has been in Wellington. His origins, however, are further south, in Christchurch. Basically, I've always wanted to be an architect, and I, st I got a job uh, through a person who uh, went to school with me, or a young kid who went to school with me. His father was an architect, and I was thinking of going to work for the Ministry of Works, so uh, it was quite good to get into a private office. And when I got there, I became the print boy. So I used to take the prints and go messages on my bicycle. Most of the time I've just been colouring drawings and, and watching everyone else work. There was some quite strong work being done, both by Miles Warren and Peter Bevan, and emulated by other officers in Christchurch, one of which I worked for. Um, Bevan and Warren were certainly the strongest of the lot, and they, their rivalry produced some very good buildings at that time compared with the rest of the buildings around New Zealand. And uh, it became what was known as the sort of Christchurch style. For a time, Athfield worked in the office of Miles Warren, perhaps New Zealand's best known architect. That was, uh, well, it was interesting. It was a very restraining time for me, but, uh, you know, I, I looked forward to going there as a, as, a, as a change, you know, because I felt that I learnt a lot while I, while I was there. But it was the type of office we walked in at uh, nine o'clock in the morning when an office started at half past eight and everyone said, good afternoon, you know. And when Miles came in, they all sort of stood up. But it was really, it was, it was quite nice, you know, but you could never sort of really joke down to earth with Miles. Our chief recollection, or my chief recollection of him was the, uh, his enormous sense of humour and uh, the sort of liveliness in the office. We never knew when he was being serious or when he was pulling our legs. And he used to wear this hat, which had, a, which we looked like the end of a lead-head nail pressed through his body, you know. And so I bought a hat which was similar one time. I wore it, wore it to the pub, and he got so annoyed that someone was wearing something to emulate him that he picked the hat off my head, put it on the floor, and jumped up and down, down on the hat and, and threw it over the bar to the bartender. He worked on a uh, on the sketch plans of a of a small block of flats. I suppose they'd now be called um, the fashionable word townhouses. Uh, three little houses joined together with steep roofs and uh, bedrooms tucked up into the roof, uh, and dormers popped out. A, a form that's now been used uh, many times, and the sort of forms that were developed with uh, tremendous panache and expertise by, uh, by Ath later. Athfield came to Wellington.
No, I don't think we ever thought much about Wellington before we came. Someone gave me a job, and the job was fairly attractive, so I, we came here. Well, I suppose if we hadn't started the house, we might not have stayed, but I like it. The topography is good. It, uh, it hasn't really been destroyed, and the city still, still stays in the same place. It's visually an exciting city. You know where you are, and it's contained. I think uh, the nice thing about it is that uh, you can't feel complacent. You it's sort of it, you never get the better of a place. You never feel smug about it. People are changing all the time, and uh, the weather keeps you from being complacent. He began to build houses, the first his own house, its form as a result of a desire to be noticed. Others quickly followed, and Asfield began indeed to be noticed. It soon became obvious that Asfield's influences go back further than Christchurch a colonial architectural past. At the same time, a number of other architects, people like Gordon Muller and Roger Walker, were starting to build interesting new structures. Something like a Wellington school began to emerge. There were a group of people, probably started off by it, who were in practice and starting to build things, mainly houses, I guess, and uh, I think in various ways they were reacting to Wellington landscape, the strong topography, in that most sites that you start to deal with are uh, probably steep. Um, and I think that um, you got quite a stimulating sort of environment, rather similar to the situation that, that occurred in Christchurch in the late 50s with people like Warren and Bevan and Cowie and um, Lucking and each person sort of influenced the other and so that uh, you got a sort of a, a very quick build-up of ideas and influence flowing around this group although they were all working independently and uh, I think for that reason you got some pretty interesting sort of uh, buildings. However, this sudden upsurge of a new style in Wellington left some people confused as to which work was Athfield's. Yeah, well, you can't really blame them because it's the initial impact, but I think ours differ quite a lot from uh, other housing which has been produced recently. Uh, I think uh, they, it differs for two reasons. One is that we try and work in with the existing situation, which we find the existing environment and surroundings. Uh, we are prepared to change our technique relative to the client that we have or the availability of materials and we involve our client uh, in most cases uh, fairly intimately into the building process. They uh, are probably a lot softer than some of the other things which which have been built or been, uh, our work has been compared with. We've uh, tended to use uh, restrained materials and we've tended to uh, restrain ourselves in the use of colour. Um, they have uh, houses which aren't, uh, cannot be defined as, as one uh, particular thing but they are things which are a continuing growth process so they grow from what's existing and uh, lend themselves to further growth from that point onwards where many of the other things are a statement by themselves. I think uh, what we've tried to do is respect the neighbourhood that we get into, in most cases anyway. A couple of times we've provided shock statements because it's been important to try and uh, do this because it's been the, you, one couldn't do anything else. Right. 
the day continues at Asfield Architects. About lunchtime, S visits a client. What time did you get away from Ross? <laughs> you didn't get away, <laughs> dirty bastard. <laughs> Of Athfield's clients, Neville Porteous is probably the closest to his architect. Well, it started by Neville coming to us because he'd seen our work before and met at me at a party. And uh, he had $130 stuffed in front of his pocket and he pulled it out in a rather bashful way and said, I want you to build me a house. And Neville had brought us a, a seashell which he'd found on the beach and said, I, I sort of think it could, could it be look like this because it's such a beautiful shell. We decided to build the building out of demolition material because at that time, in 1969, Demolition material was very cheap and bricks you could get for $10 a truckload. And then his first bricks started to arrive and he got 15 truckloads of bricks. But unfortunately we didn't check them before they left the site. First time I saw them was about the eighth truckload going up on the road here. And uh, they are all in one lump. They were cement and mortar bricks and they'd been dumped into the site. So he spent the next 18 months, two years, breaking these bricks. Part. My opinion is that any ar ar architect can design a magnificent place if his, if his client has an unlimited amount of money available. We started off here, we had $200 and no land. This house was, we, we actually excavated it completely before the house was designed. I would say that Ath made something like 20 visits here and he'd say, dig a little platform here, dig a little platform there and we'd dig it, and it'd, so the, this is why the house is so closely related to the land. It's architecture which promotes, rather than restricts, the variety of human nature. He offers us architecture which is not solely related to the amount of money which a cli client has available. He's flexible, at all times he's flexible, even during the the actual construction of the house. He, uh, according to the building materials which we were able to get, and as you can see, most of the stuff we've used here is from old buildings which have been pulled down, mostly for the motorway. Uh, he, he was able to adapt the plans, accommodate errors that I had made. It's uh, architecture which is not solely related to the demands of local council bylaws. Uh, he, refu he, he, he definitely refuses to compromise. But I, I, I think too that he's very conscious of the fact that rooms, the use to which a room is put, can be uh, adapted to the needs of the people that live in there, in, in the house. For example, at the moment, we are living in what we hope will become a, a music room at the moment, yeah. my wife and I. Our bedroom is actually a music room. Yeah. And, you know, etc. he never done any building work before. And the first day that he arrived on uh, my site to give us a hand, he had to wear uh, woolen gloves to dig a hole because he got blisters in them. Oh, I got those. <laughs> no, hang on, there's oh. one's behind falling down. Then over, over three, years he, he was building, uh, he always started building. Uh, he put four inches on his chest, lost his asthma, which he had, and uh, became a very proficient, proficient builder. But Neville really has extended that house far beyond what we ever envisaged in the first place, and it's just as much Neville as it is me in that house. I think that's, an, that's the nice thing about it. Athfield's architecture seems to inspire stronger feelings in others. I know that Ath's architecture 
provokes people to extremely hostile reactions, some people. I know that, for example, that there is even somebody who threatened his life. I can't really say too much about that because the threat may still hold. I think if you build something different in an existing neighbourhood or established neighbourhood, uh, you invite uh, reactions, and that reaction can vary from a mild criticism uh, to praise to violent aggression. And I think uh, in this house we've had, had everything. Um, we've, um, you know, we've even had someone uh, fire at the tower and we've got a couple of bullet holes through it. Uh, I think that we live in a particularly, in, in a community which is particularly hostile to change and perhaps even to originality. I know Ath believes that in a society, originality, skill, energy, these are things which should be rewarded. But oftentimes they're things which are penalised. Um, Criticism comes from more traditional sources as well. Ath puts together very complex forms uh, with extraordinary uh, panache. Um, he uses um, the scale generally is small uh, and the overall form is very complex. Um, I don't think the forms necessarily derive from uh, what te takes place. I suspect in some cases they are uh, imposed upon the uh, uh, design. It's all done with uh, an extraordinary um, uh, wit and uh, amusement. Now, um, that's often a dangerous quality in, in architecture. What is amusing uh, one year is, uh, is a bore, even a year later. It's like uh, uh, old editions of the punch. And that, to um, us older puritanical uh, architects, brought up on the form follows function, form should be at least symbolic of function, um, is, a, uh, is a worrisome quality. Well, I think it's, it's, it's concerning that the liveliest architects can only work for the elites. And it concerns me that in the last 30 years or so in New Zealand, there's been a group, architects being among them, of what I would call selfish professionals, who I think can be shown have added to growing inequality in New Zealand by their orientation to marketplace demands so they can really only work for the well-to-do. And as a group, they haven't told us otherwise. They haven't acted on what social conscience, what public service there is in that profession. The rhetoric is still there of public service, but the feet move in, in reserved, exclusive directions. Despite the attention Athfield's architecture has always attracted, there are setbacks. Wellington's growing skyline, for instance, is still devoid of any trace of Athfield architects. Yeah, well, these are some of the high-rise blocks we got involved with. Um, one, uh, oh, look, no, oh, you have to start me off again, sorry, <laughs> yeah. We've been involved in, in several, you know, large high-rise developments with uh, three or four, three or four different sites around town, but we've pr produced sort of numerous schemes for those buildings. We've started off with, uh, you know, c uh, considerably different buildings, you know, with pipes all over them little bits of um, small-scale units at street level out in front of them. Tremendously different and exciting and usually terminating with a uh, strikingly different sort of uh, penthouse on top. Something that, you know, gives each, each block a real identity of its own. But successively we've been knocked back by uh, developers not being interested in it because uh, it's changes the company image or the major tenant's image 
uh, no one has ever been uh, happy with the sort of development that we've been trying to work in at street level. These? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, we all dabble in high-rise buildings a bit. You know, we've had a fair share of them. They, they take up time and money, but they're quite good. You get involved. If you get one off, then you make quite a bit of jam. You know, they're, they're good to get in, involved in because, you know, it's just all the same all the way up, you know, <laughs> you can get more fees. But uh, we also have a fair share of bad luck with them. We were working on a building for the Siemens Union, and they were deregistered at the time. We were working on a building for JBL, and they went bankrupt, you know, so we've had our problems. Mm, we might get one off the ground, a smaller one. Again, Asfield's attempts at housing a wider section of the public have not been an unqualified success. Asfield in 1970. Well, this is a housing development which we are at present doing on the slopes of Mount Victoria and Wellington. They're two bedroom flats right throughout the whole scheme, but the lower flats give the, the people outside garden space. These lower flats give people balconies of varying sizes. They have varying orientations so that different people can share different types of element. We have semi-public spaces where people can walk through the whole environment. In certain instances, uh, people can look into other people's windows, which we think is an advantage, really, in this type of development, because um, it increases the contact between people. Well, what we hope to do with a heterogeneous type of development is to introduce a cross-section of people back into the city. Uh, I think what we've tended to do before is build multi-rise buildings, which have only introduced one type of person back into the city. Yeah, well, we've been involved in about three or four housing projects for private individuals, uh, this being one. Uh, this has gone further than any of the others, but only five units have been built since 1969. There's a total of 24 units. Uh, we've got another block of flats which have just reached the foundation stage and they've stopped, and another couple of blocks which haven't got off the ground. And we've done one compromise situation for the council where we were told what to do, what height to put the windows, what size flats to use, what arrangements, and these seem to seem to move. So if you placate the people, <laughs> your clients, you're more likely to get the things finished. I sort of understand it. I find it very frustrating. I understand it because the type of client that we we usually get uh, a tend to be the fringe client with uh, less monetary resources than the established type of client. Late in the day, the office normally retired to the Shamrock. Well, the mother's here, eh? <laughs> Asfield's concerns go beyond the frustrations of work. Dullness is created quite often by uh, the sameness, the same type of buildings, the same sort of regulations applying to each site, the same sort of economic structures which apply to the development of each site. And when one wants to develop, there's a whole lot of rules which dictate the size and relationships of your buildings. The other th balancing factor about cities quite often is that there are a few older buildings left. Unfortunately, in Wellington, there, there are parts of the city which are really dull, where a few years ago they were quite exciting because there are new buildings and old buildings um, side by side. But it's when people start to rationalise cities, and this is what we've tended to do. Uh, we've s said, in some ways, that uh, all buildings which are earthquake risk must be t taken to the ground. Well, some of our better buildings are earthquake risk. Uh, really, everything's wrong with areas like Parua. It's n certainly not the people, it's the way we've gone about it in the first place. Uh, there's just no chance of developing a heterogeneous type of community. There's no chance of people meeting other people by accident. Uh, they've been built mainly on the assumption that uh, all New Zealanders wanted a quarter acre site. Uh, they are built because, in some ways, that was the easiest way to do it. Because 
we build a lot of things by measuring what we've got. We sometimes don't question uh, whether what we've got is the right thing or not. The people really don't enjoy living there. Well, some people will say they enjoy living there because they don't have an alternative. If you do a survey and say, do you enjoy living here or not, people will say, yes, I enjoy living here. But on a relative basis, if people were given an option, they wouldn't enjoy living there. And so as a result of frustrations at home and the winning of a competition, Athfield finds himself in Manila. Perhaps here at least, ideas will be realized. How far have we got to go to town? He's apprehensive. It's over a year since he was in Vancouver, and since then there has been no word from the Philippines. He's anxious to know what's going on. Will the scheme be built? And how relevant are the ideas and preconceptions of a man who's never before been in the country for which his scheme was designed? Rumours have reached New Zealand to the effect that the scheme, dependent as it is on the degree of cooperation between the government and the squatters, has become a victim of the continued tension between the two. It still looks like a traditional actor's paradise. <laughs> It is known that the government has received a loan of $65 million from the World Bank for work in the Tondo and Degat de Gatan. An agreement has been reached under the conditions of the loan that only 20% of the people in Tondo will be relocated. Perhaps the end result will be yet another disappointment for Athfield. Yes, cigarette. Cigarette? No, no, no cigarettes. No, no. Don't smoke. The overall scheme is to house 140,000. The prototype barangay, or village, to house 3,500 people on five hectares of land. I think the most important things were the establishment of a workplace within the confines of the community that we're going to uh, work in this place. Uh, the second thing was the encouragement of self-help housing. Um, and the workplace was used for the protection of this encouragement, so we created a workspace around the periphery of the community in the form of a wall, and then uh, people could move inside the community and gradually build their housing in their own time, and the wall protected them from the outside people and enabled the community to, to de develop in its own time. Uh, the third thing that uh, we insisted on was the um, development of an educational program and a community cooperative which would control uh, the building materials which came into the uh, community and um, educate people in the use of building materials and the uh, understanding of things like insulation, party walls, uh, how to build in relationship to your neighbours in the first instance. And then the fourth aspect of it was the, um, again, an educational process, but it was establishment of energy centres, which would combine the energy and the waste problems of the community and the industry. The end result may be entirely different than this, but um, it shows the basic unit which we were intending to provide. That was a five metre by three metre unit with a roof and four poles, which can be seen uh, in this one here, and then people over a period of time would gradually add to these units with their own materials. We also uh, suggested the use of coconut timber because we know there is quite a supply of coconut timber in the Philippines with no end use. The balance of the buildings we intended to use uh, reused corrugated iron which would be rolled into expanded metal sheets and in turn this would be plastered over with uh, sand and cement plaster which the people could do themselves. This is the scheme, but will it in fact be built? 
Hatfield is keen to talk to those with power. He meets again Ambassador Helena Benitez. She was the Philippines representative at the Habitat Conference in Vancouver. She is now the Philippines ambassador to the United Nations. And the people are very warm, you know. They, you have to talk to the people. But I understand. Uh, you know, you're that, here, that, that, and yes. um, this is good. I mean, I'm yes. very happy you're here. I also talked to the president, you know. I even, uh, when the president was very worried over the Saba question, I kind of got in and uh, brought General Tobias at a um, cocktail just before Mrs. Marcus left for Libya. And uh, he's, right away he said to General Tobias, how much is this going to cost? Where's the costing? Then Dr. Jose Benitez head of the Philippines Human Settlements Commission, the group that coordinated the competition, and an all-important one in the Philippines. Very little can be planned there without their consent. Now taking place in We're still grappling with the implementation aspects and um, the integration of a design into the overall community development process that uh, must take place. Because we, there's anything we've learned that you can't build a structure of five hectares and assume that overnight you will have a community. The question must be put, will the scheme go ahead? Well, I don't think the government really has, has said no, except that there are lots of things the government has to go through. The land itself, you know, has to be cleared, the, the infrastructure there, uh, the position of the land is good, it's near the, um, the area that the World Bank is committed to invest on. So some of the infrastructure of that investment in Tonda from the World Bank will naturally flow into this area. But from what I understand, I don't know the details because I've been in and out of the country, that there are a number of legal uh, steps still to be taken, acquisition of the land and um, probably definition of its boundaries and so on. I really can't say um, de definitively yes or no. I know we're taking it. Uh, very seriously in the integration of the overall program. The implementation right now is under study by the National Housing Authority. Um, clearly, we, we would want as much as possible uh, to completely implement as much as has been incorporated in the scheme. But uh, to tell you exactly what can now of this scheme be implemented and what can't be is really within the purview right now of the National Housing Authority, and they're making a very deliberate uh, assessment of how much of this can be implemented. So for the time being, there is no real answer. Above all, Athfield is anxious to meet the people for whom he made his design. A trip is made to the Tondo itself. We only play strip jack naked. <laughs> For architect Athfield, as he's known here, the meeting is a remarkable one. You're fixing your stove. Shirley. That's a very English name, isn't it? Shirley. What's your friend's name? Tina. Tina. While in the Tondo, he sees some other schemes being undertaken by the government and the World Bank. He is not impressed. You've regimented something to a point already, you know, by doing this without 
people participation. As soon as you get that regimentation, you force people into a physical arrangement, which doesn't exist back there. Units being it's still this race now, isn't it, all the time? You know, this bloody uh, engineering grid. You know, when you go through there, everyone wants to place people and sort of. Traffic engineers having control uh, again. One yeah. of our engineers here. Ian <laughs> Hi. This is Ben De Mesa. Yeah. Hi, Ben. This was the stuff that the World Bank uh, bloody, uh, worked on. You got a feeling it's built rough because it's supposed to be squatter housing. Mm. <laughs> but ideas are good, and yet when they're put into practice, the same thing happens with the physical. Relationships are all predetermined before they get the people along. It's just, uh, it's just middle class housing done cheaply. Hello? So you were children? Yeah. What is your particular purpose in coming here? Well, uh, just to see what it, what it's like. What can you? You know, <laughs> if you think about something for a long time and then you decide to, uh, uh, and it plays on your mind, you, it's quite good to be able to s see it too. So for the meantime, you're just canvassing what you can... Uh, just. Yeah, just, just, going. <laughs> just going around, fishing out ideas. So you don't understand any Tagalog word yet? No, no. You have not started studying? No, not yet. <laughs> you will learn to like our dialect. Hmm? Well, <laughs> like the dialect of the bird. <laughs> and how old is he? How old is Robert? That's only six months old. He's pretty lively six months, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> While in the Tondo, Athfield finds Mrs. Trinidad Herrera, who was supposed to have been on the judging panel of the competition as a representative of the Tondo people. Instead, she was jailed without trial for a year and allegedly tortured. She was released in April of this year. You have in the Tondo is a fair basis for starting anyway, and the way the houses are built are beautiful and probably far better than what I could do them anyway. By 1978, part of uh, Tondo Foreshore will be demolished to give way to the International Port Development Project. So we said before any development project can be, or any houses can be touched, the aspirations and needs of the people should first be con uh, considered. The curious thing is that her organization, Zotto, is unfamiliar with Asfield's plan. This is not overly surprising when one remembers that the people themselves are only minimally consulted about the competition. Uh, first of all, uh, we said that uh, we, we come from the civic organization. And then we said that uh, we don't have representative during the uh, judging competition. What, what was the uh, design? Uh, I mean, the winning design, what is it all about? We don't know the exact uh, picture of the winning design, except for some materials from the newspaper, which were shared to us by some friends. They sent us some materials here, including the winning design. The trip to the Tondo has made Athfield rethink, to an extent, his original ideas. Uh, I think one of the things that I've done is misjudged how much the people can do for themselves. The difference between what I did and what's in the Tondo at present is that a totally resettlement area is quite different than working within an existing area. I think it's um, much easier in some ways to work with an existing area because all it requires is some sort of conservative pruning. It was incredible. It was, the, the feeling there was much better than what I thought. It wasn't... Um, uh, it's desperate, but it's, in, but it, it's clean. The people seem to be happy. They have a purpose. Um, the houses are immaculate inside. The surroundings uh, probably could be helped quite a bit. But within the houses, there's an incredible sense of pride. You know, put it this way, if I was working here, I would rather work within the Tondo than work in Dagatakatan. It's much easier if you've got something to hinge around, if you've got a community to work with. It's a very beautiful uh, starting point. There's 
Then comes a meeting that may be conclusive. General Tobias, head of the National Housing Authority, the body that would actually build the scheme. If anyone is Athfield's client, it is this man. It's quite interesting to meet you personally now, <laughs> uh, being one of those judges in the international competition. <laughs> to be coming face to face with you is quite an experience in a way. Well, as I said, I think uh, your people are ready to make a, a documentation, so to speak, of uh, this obligation of the Philippine government to you. So may I invite you for a formal presentation of this, this thing here? Yeah? Mr. Atbil, this is actually, according to our terms or the terms of the competition, you are supposed to receive an additional price money, so to speak. Even when the government uh, failed to make a decision of whether your design will be implemented or not. We have some technical difficulties, physical difficulties of the area. So in the meantime, perhaps it is best that uh, we present this this uh, balance, so to speak, of uh, the uh, compensation to you. So in behalf of the uh, Philippine government, Mr. Atfield, may I present this uh, balance of uh, our obligation to you. Thank and you. Thank you so much. The meeting seems to have been conclusive. Two weeks later, however, back in New Zealand, Asfield seems more a optimistic. Ago, I didn't think I had any future in the Philippines, and uh, after visiting there, I think now that there is a role I can play. Uh, something between what I thought I was doing a year ago and something uh, which the community has really taught me over the last two or three weeks. I'm certain there's a role that an individual can play between what is present being done by the housing authority there in the government and by the World Bank Sites and Services Program. There's certainly uh, an intermediate role that uh, an individual in my position can play in the Philippines. So hopefully I'll have an opportunity to work back there. You think that'll happen? Uh, yeah, I'm certainly more confident about it than when we arrived in the Philippines and uh, I'd really like to work there. <laughs>